Okay, so uh, a final thing that I want to mention in this first foundational lesson for our course on close reading Macbeth is the uh, literary period that Shakespeare worked in. Right? So many times we like to classify artists, including authors, by their literary period. And Shakespeare's literary period we associate with Queen Elizabeth, called Elizabethan literature. So let's talk just a little bit about this. Uh, Shakespeare established himself as a successful actor and playwright during the reign of Queen Elizabeth. This is 1558 to 1603. Of course, Macbeth is written 1606 or staged in 1606, which is three years after the death of Elizabeth, but most of his plays and most of his experience happens during her reign. Uh, the period is sometimes called the English Renaissance or the English Golden Age. Now, we perhaps have studied the Renaissance in Italy with people like Michelangelo and city-states like Florence where great works of art, often painting and architecture, are propping up in this explosion of artistic beauty. Well, England had its own Renaissance, and England's Renaissance primarily manifested itself in literary arts, and Shakespeare is one of the most important artists in the English Renaissance. Uh, other important uh, Elizabethan writers include Edmund Spencer, Philip Sidney, and Sir Walter Raleigh. Just a quick note about each of them. Edmund Spencer, he was a popular poet. He wrote The Fairy Queen. Um, Philip Sidney is really important not just for his poetry, but for his uh, critical work. He wrote some of the foundational documents that literary scholars today use at English language universities. And Sir Walter Raleigh was an interesting historical figure. He was a courtier, meaning he hung out in Queen Elizabeth's palace and knew the nobility. And he was also an important poet in his own right. Uh, Shakespeare's work, right, in addition to being in the Elizabethan period, extends into the reign of King James who became King of England in 1603 when Elizabeth died. Uh, and just a note, uh, King James's literature is called Jacobian literature, right? Whereas Queen Elizabeth, we call it Elizabethan literature, okay? Um, so we could talk a lot about Elizabethan literature. We could talk about the other playwrights in the period. We could talk about the nonfiction written in the period. We could talk about the poetry in the period and so on and so forth. What I want to talk about, since we're going to be focusing on plays, namely Macbeth in this course, I want to talk about one other important contribution to Elizabethan literature that Macbeth made that had nothing to do with the plays and had to do with poetry. So what we see here on our screen is a kind of poem called a sonnet. Now, we're not going to read it, and it's actually in Italian. This sonnet is written by a poet from Italy named Petrarch. And Petrarch worked about 300 years before Shakespeare in the 13th century. And just like students today in China and around the world are studying Shakespeare, who is a poet and a dramatist from 16th century England, in Shakespeare's day, students and aspiring writers loved to study Petrarch, this 13th century poet. And they were really inspired by this form of poem that he created called the sonnet. Now, uh, Shakespeare took the sonnet and he changed it and he made it his own. And he wrote 154 of these sonnets, including Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, probably the most famous of them. And he codified them into a very specific form. And this form today is known as the uh, Shakespearean sonnet. That's how big of an impact he had on this poetic form. And here we have sonnet three, a very uh, famous sonnet, which is kind of uh, the speaker is talking to the addressee, who presumably is a young man. And he's saying, now is the time for you to fall in love and have children because when you become old, you can look into the face of your children and see your own youth, right? And we're not going to analyze this poem today. It would take too long. But what I do want everyone here to recognize is first that Shakespeare's influence extended beyond the play, beyond the tragedy, beyond the comedy, to the sonnet form and English poetry. And also, I want you to understand what the definition of a sonnet is. Because if you take an AP exam or an IB exam or the SAT2 literature exam, 
um, you're going to need to know what a sonnet is and be able to recognize this poetic form. So a sonnet, first of all, is always 14 lines. And indeed, if we count, we have 14 lines here. A uh, sonnet always has 10 syllables per line. Right? Every line of a poem is its own unit. And in the traditional sonnet form, every line has 10 syllables. We're not going to count now. That would take too long. And, but what's maybe most memorable about a sonnet, an English sonnet, is the rhyme scheme. Right? So I'm going to write that down here. Sonnets rhyme. And the rhyme scheme is the pattern of how the lines rhyme. So if we take a look, look in thy glass and tell the face thou viewest, now is the time that face should form another, whose fresh repair, if now thou not renewest, thou dost beguile the world, unbless some mother. So we can notice that viewest and renewest rhyme. Another and mother rhyme. And if we were annotating this, we would write it A, B, a, B. In the next four lines, for where is she so fair whose uneared womb disdains the tillage of thy husbandry? Or who is he so fond will be the tomb of his self-love to stop posterity? So again, we have the same rhyme here. We have womb and tomb, husbandry and posterity, right? So C, D, C, D. And of course, when the letters are the same, it means that they rhyme at the end, right? Thou art thy mother's glass, and she in thee calls back the lovely April of her prime. So thou through windows of thine age shall see, despite of wrinkles, this thy golden time. So again, the C prime time. We would write E, F, E, F. And what's most special about a Shakespearean sonnet is that the last two lines don't alternate. They're not different. They're always rhyme. So the last two lines we have here is, but if thou live, remembered not to be, die single, and thine image dies with thee. B and the. So we would write G and G. And this final line, these final two lines here, has a very special name that we're going to be using when we analyze Macbeth. The name here is a couplet. So, of course, a couple, C-O-U-P-L-E, means two, right? A unit of two. A couplet means two lines that rhyme, such as B and D. So, the Shakespearean sonnet is important because it shows that Shakespeare's influence in Elizabethan literature extended beyond the play, beyond Macbeth and Hamlet and King Lear and Othello and The Merchant of Venice and Romeo and Juliet. It extended into poetry where he codified one of the most important English poetic forms. It's also important because if you take a test like the AP, IB, or SAT2, you're going to need to be able to recognize that a sonnet has 14 lines, 10 syllables per line. This is called iambic pentameter, by the way. Um, and that it ends in a rhyming couplet. Okay? And finally, in Shakespeare's plays, like Macbeth, Oftentimes, very important speeches made by characters are going to rhyme in a couplet when Shakespeare wants the audience to pay special attention to them. So throughout our work together, there are going to be several times when you see me pointing to a couplet, right, where the, uh, the last two lines of a speech are going to rhyme in the form of a couplet, much like the hallmark of the Shakespearean sonnet. So in today's lesson, we laid the foundations for later, more sophisticated and challenging reading and analysis. We talked about who Shakespeare is, why we still study him today. We talked about Shakespeare's body of work. Besides Macbeth, one of his most important tragedies, why else do we read him? We talked about Shakespeare's English, and we learned some techniques for avoiding being confused by what seems like very different English, but what really is remarkably similar to the English we use today. And we ended by taking a look at Elizabethan literature beyond Shakespeare and getting a sense of how he's understood in the history of English literature and why he's important beyond Macbeth.
In our next lesson, we're going to be talking more about Shakespeare's Macbeth, and we're every lesson going to go more and more sophisticated in our analysis. And if you work hard, do your homework, read the play, pay attention, I promise you, together, you will recognize some of the important, interesting meanings of Macbeth, and you'll be able to read and analyze the play on your own. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in our next lesson when I, Edward Dunnigan, and the Bud Education partner to deliver you yet another lesson in our close reading course on Macbeth.